getting food to people who cannot afford it is way more important than delivering food to teenagers that order it on the Postmates app. Reusing things is awesome. And it's something yeah. that is really impactful in the climate space. Hey everyone, thank you so much for joining the Behind Company Line podcast. Today we have Chai and Div, founders of Liquid Donate. Liquid Donate is a sustainability and social impact solution for retailers and businesses to donate unsellable goods to nonprofits. Chai and Div, I'm so excited to chat with both of you, not only because of your entrepreneurial journey, which is really exciting, but also this whole kind of sustainability kind of motion that a lot of companies are leaning into where we see just so much surplus in the world and there's so many individuals that need make materials, clothes, goods, and it's out there. But for some reason, there's a disconnect connecting the two of those different parties. So really interested to see about how you're able to solve that problem, but also where you're going with it and where the company is going to take. So before we get into all that, Chai, what were you doing before you started the company? Uh, I'll have you go first. Hi, Julian. Thanks for hosting us. What I was doing before Liquidonate was working with Diz at Postmates. Yeah. Yeah. We've had the opportunity of working together in the past. And for four years at Postmates, we built other social impact products. They were mostly around food. And yeah. one of the biggest products that we built there was to salvage leftover food from restaurants and have it donated to local food banks and nonprofits. Yeah. Uh, I'll let this talk about the other product that we built at Postmates while we were working together. Yeah, yeah. I know Gimps asked Divs, I would love for you to share as well, kind of your part of that story. But but in addition to that, also curious about what is, what is needed. It seems simple. Okay, I have extra food, I have extra stuff to give or give away. At that time, what was needed in terms of like from a supply chain or operational standpoint to actually deliver that? Yeah, absolutely. Well, Julian, thanks for having us on the show. Super excited to be here with Chai and representing Liquid Donate. To answer your first question, I was the 15th employee at Postmates, so I spent a lot of time in the early days at Postmates running customer service, started our sales and business development team, signed the first 500 restaurants to the platform, did some PM work on the merchant tablet, which is what most third-party delivery companies are still using today, and then was working with Chai on our social impact technology at, at Postmates. So the other product that I wanted to shout out is called Bento. It's still going strong today, and it enables people who don't have access to smartphones to text the word hungry to a specific phone number and receive a free meal on the back, paid for on the back end by a foundation at the nearest Postmates pickup restaurant. And for that, we won the Time Magazine Invention of the Year Award. So that was definitely a catalyst. And Chai and I working together and working more, together more strongly and feeling really confident in, in what we could accomplish together. And at Postmates, the main thing we did is that we, we matched food with people, right? Right. And so building yeah. a food security product is really what was important there. And so when we started Liquid Donate, the idea mm. was around how could we be more category agnostic? There is so much need in the world. There is so much excess yeah. inventory in the world. And it, it, for nonprofits, I mean, I've, I've been a community organizer and activist since I was 16. And yeah. so working with a number of different nonprofits, I mean, they need different things from technology to food to clothing. Yeah. It really depends on what the nonprofit is, who, what clientele they're serving and, and what their goals are. And so... Being able to be a completely category agnostic platform with Liquid Donate to match any and all excess inventory is is really, really cool. Yeah, yeah. And and just to double up on that on that question or in response to that, yeah, how much of inventory just in general kind of goes on you, whether you were seeing it on the postmate side versus seeing it from large brands or distributors, how much of that materials or goods are going unused? Yeah. So according to the National Retail Federation on the retail side, 80% of returns go directly to the landfill or end up in the landfill after being returned. And so Impressive. that is a huge number. So yeah, eight zero, eight zero, eighty percent. It's it's wild. And so we're able to take that eighty percent and divert it completely from going to the landfill wow. using the technology that Chai and, and our entire technology team has built, yeah. where we automatically route it to the nonprofits and schools that need it instead. Yeah. No, no. And and Chai, I'm so curious to think about like how do you categorize such a large amount of inventory from different distributors? Because I'm, I'm sure categorizing food inventory versus clothes versus other goods or services is challenging, but also connecting that with the right party. How are you able to connect those two systems? I think that they're, they're fairly different and, and disparate. Sure. So let me tell you what we're trying to achieve with the Liquid on it as a tech product. So what you brought up is right. There's a huge amount of inventory that's actually going to landfill. 
Yeah. Uh, but it's what's important is where all of this inventory is coming from. So our by our estimate, there's like a million established retail establishments in the US and maybe say two million nonprofits in the US. Mm -hmm. These are national and local nonprofits. And all of these folks are, all of these retailers are like producing a lot of inventory in terms of customer returns or yeah. stuff that they cannot sell, which is just sitting in warehouses. So what we are building is a matching algorithm. And yeah. our matching algorithm is going to do the job of finding who is the best nonprofit that an item can be donated to. And this takes into account several attributes into a factor when matching, like say the location of where the inventory is, Sure. Who's the, the nonprofit's preference in terms of what category they want? Sometimes it also takes into account the focus areas and the demographic that the nonprofit serves. And all of these factors help us make a perfect decision as to where the product should be routed to. Yeah. It's also thinking about one thing I think about is like, what do you do if, say, you are in this matchmaking process and things don't transact? And, and, have you ever been left with just a bunch of inventory that had to redistribute? Did that ever happen? Or what, what allowed that to not kind of come up or come about in, in this process? So for, either of you. Uh, for, for some context, our company has been around for like a year and a half or so now, and we have not had any waste so far. We've had hundred percent match rate of everything that's been donated on our platform. But to tell you more about what, how we are thinking about handling the and in case when we are not able to find a nonprofit, we also want to partner with like circular economy partners who are into like maybe dismantling whatever's donated, whatever's given to them and recycling those parts into like better upcycling those parts into like better goods. So all of these different solutions will help us avoid the item from going to landfill and make sure that somebody gets to use it. Yeah. yeah. And I can, I can put a number to it too. Our goal is that 95% of the products on our platform, once we become more mature as a company, are going into the hands of nonprofits and schools to use the item for the same or a similar use as it was originally intended for. And then that 5% that isn't the right quality, condition, type of item that someone would want to be matched with, the, our system will automatically route that to the right circular economy player, whether it's going to be a product going to compost or a textile yeah. will be broken down to be turned into a thread to make new products. Yeah. yeah. Just to give some context to the audience, and I know you mentioned a lot of those products would go to the landfill in particular, but were there other programs that companies were trying? And, and if they were trying, what made them unsuccessful? And, and I mean that because of that large number, if, if, if most more companies were successful in kind of whether diminishing their supply or be, having better kind of order count, numbers like that. What, in, what was the incumbent before that? They're like, okay, I have a bunch of supply. I don't want to just throw it away. What are my options here? What were the options back then? Ch uh, Div, I'll, I'll let you go. Yeah, so I'll answer first and Chai, feel free to add in. But the uh, I, I like that you think that most retailers didn't want to landfill it. That's a very positive outlook. It is cheaper. It was cheaper to throw the items into the landfill rather than reselling them in many cases for retailers before Liquid Donate. Yeah. And so we knew that our main competitor was price, yeah. sending it to the landfill. And so because we're a software company, we were able to keep the price so low that it's almost a no-brainer for yeah. the retailers to use our service to match their products with nonprofits. And we're not cannibalizing any potential full-price customers as well. And so those two things combined have made, have made a big difference when we're talking to retailers about how they could be more sustainable. A lot of folks at these larger companies have a few people who really do care about sustainability and want to push this. But for a lot of companies, it does come down to the bottom line, even for small businesses too. And so us being cheaper than the alternative, which is throwing it away, makes it so that we're really the most viable option for them. Yeah. And, and Chai, I'm, I'm curious, how are you able to build a system that it kind of creates this sustainability, this low price engine? Is it just a lot of operational kind of heavy lifting that you did at, at, at your time at Postmates and then kind of iterating on that? What in particular allowed you to really decrease the, the cost of, of doing this for these, these customers? You're right. Like Diz and I, our experience at Postmates factors a lot into what we build at Liquid Donate. Yeah. Postmates was a, a food logistics company and we saw the problem and how it managed like moving food from one restaurant to a customer quickly. And yeah. doing it fast. 
So with the products that the retailers are giving, like the timeline might not be as urgent as like food because yeah. they understand that trucks will be delayed and then, I don't know, warehouses might be closed or their distances need to be traveled, much longer distances need to be traveled yeah. before something actually gets donated. So all of that experience actually helps us build a better product for moving these donations from retailers to nonprofit. To get into a little more detail, we partner with um, third party logistic companies who offer different sizes of vehicles for transporting these yeah. goods. So you can imagine something that might be donated on like, say a bicycle with a product like Uber Direct to something that might have to fit on a large truck and have to be transported across state lines. Yeah. So there are several third party providers who offer work with different kinds of drivers and vehicles and we partnering with them allows us to choose the right vehicle for the right donation. Yeah. It's so amazing to think about how the technology has evolved, not only to build really sophisticated, lean, inexpensive systems, but also we have this amazing partnership kind of ecosystem yes. where if I'm doing this component, I can add on a microservice and be able to take on something that I would normally have to build internally. How is that yeah. the timing of what you're, where you are now just really advantageous for what you want to build? Do you, do you think about that at all? I'll, I'll open it up to both of you. Did go ahead first. It's super advantageous. I mean, I think the the fact that as a company, we're asset light. We are a climate tech company that's focused on landfill diversion and reducing the emissions of products. And so for the some of the integrations that Chai is talking about, one of them is we work directly with return services. So something you mm -hmm. may or may not know is a majority of returns, at least in the United States, are handled by third party companies. Yeah. not by the retailers themselves. And there's, by our estimate, about 35 major companies that are playing in that space. And so we're working directly with three of them today. One of them is Loop Returns. And with these return services, what we do is when the retailer knows that product is going to be unsellable for any reason, instead of routing it back to their distribution center where they're then going to pay a handling fee, a storage fee, another shipping fee, and then ultimately a landfilling fee, which can add up really quick on top of the cost of their refund and the shipping. We actually yeah. just show them a return label for a nonprofit in our database that's near to them. Yeah. And so we reduce the cost of shipping, we reduce the distance traveled, so we reduce the emissions, and we keep that product out of the landfill and, and sent directly to a nonprofit. So that is something that is super easy to set up, to turn on. It takes almost no engineering work from our team once it's been built other than some basic maintenance. And yeah. uh, that is something that helps us really scale how quickly mm -hmm. the products can move through our system. And it gives the retailers choice over what's happening to their product while reducing their costs significantly. Yeah, I'm not yeah. sure if that was the question you asked at this point, but it's something <laughs> I'm really excited about. So yeah. No, yeah, no. It's like the the result of the technology and, and the result of what being built and what's oh, and possible. Oh, the partnerships. Oh, I did want to say something else. Yeah. Like the the partnerships are 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 critical. I was actually just talking to a friend about this yesterday. How we're an early stage startup, and we are very grateful and lucky to have earned the right to to have funding for our Uncourt Capital for our seed stage. And we're very careful about how we spend that money, right? I mean, I think that's yeah. an important thing for for founders to be concerned about. And, but we also know that we want to do things the right way. And so mm -hmm. services like we use pilot for accounting and mm -hmm. they do like our accounting and they also do fractional CFO services and the ability to like pay into these like services yeah. that provide services for a lot of different startups. And they figured out different ways to automate these pieces means that it's extremely affordable for a startup of our size to actually have accounting yeah. from day one versus having to like backpedal years from now and like go build the books then. And so like, I just, I, I look at Liquid Donate as a similar service for retailers where we plug in in that way too. And I just think the the world has become a much more interesting and, and well-connected place because these yeah. services all work together so seamlessly. Yeah. And, and Chai, from a CTO standpoint, it just as a builder, how much of your job is creating, conceiving kind of code out of nothing and, and really just identifying what pieces you can collaborate with to take off, say, okay, the shipping logistics, you don't have to build that internally, or maybe this categorization matching, we can use this ML AI plugin from this other company. How much of your job right now is building, kind of creating out of nothing versus finding other systems that you can plug in 
to create what you figured out Liquid Donut? I think it's a bit of both. So I'll give you more context. So one of the methodologies we use at Liquid Donate for building new products is first trying things out ourselves, if even if it's manually, before yeah. we build like a full-blown integration with another software or another service. So the trying out piece allows us to validate whatever hypothesis we have about how the product should be or what the user wants. And then once we know it works, then we go ahead and do the full integration. Yeah. But to answer a little more about what you asked previously about how there are so many software services today and how it is, what it is like to like build a tech product in today's world. I definitely think it's way easier to build a logistics company in today's market with so many logistics providers than it would have been like, say, even 10 years ago. Simplest right. example is, as I said, like based on vehicle size, I have a, a variety of companies that I can integrate with to call their APIs to book our a delivery from point A to point B. Yeah. On top of that, we have aggregator services. <laughs> so if I don't want to like work individually like, directly with these third-party logistic providers, I can just work with an aggregator company and tell them what vehicle size I want. And those yeah. aggregator companies will work with the, with the 3PO providers to give me the right booking or the career. So yeah. it becomes really easy for us to like build a logistic solution in today's world because of the amount of startups like trying to solve a niche little thing in their own ecosystem. So the plug and play nature of our software avoids having to build things that take away our time and focus. Our yeah. focus is just to match items to nonprofits. And we are able to do that better because of the availability of these different companies. Yeah. Have you guys gone against the challenge of just like building the most beautiful, amazing tech product versus delivering on the actual value? Like you said, versus building all these different things, you're like, okay, this is our objective. We're going to plug in these systems, this aggregator, and we're going to achieve that versus I think a lot of founders will see the eye candy and, and want to build something cool or build it in-house or integrate all these different systems and, and really kind of make it part of their brand or something. What, what kind of makes you lean into the value of, of what you're delivering? Is it just the essence of the mission or is, is it the experience that you've come with? I think it's the essence of the mission. And mm -hmm. I think as a founder, like, and as founders, like both of us, like it becomes important for us to like keep the mission and the vision in sight all the time. Yeah. You know, our mission is to like give items a second life and make sure that they don't go into landfill as long as they can be used by someone. So if we keep that in sight, then whatever we build will just have to fall in line with that. So if mm -hmm. it's like, build, like building something in-house or if it's using something that already exists, like as long as it ties into our mission, we can use either approach. Of course, the other factor that comes into play is time and how quickly we want to deliver on, I don't know, whichever client needs to use our product. Yeah. And at the end of the day, our mission is our main purpose. And that should be the deciding factor if we want to build something in-house or use something that's existing. And for yeah. what it's worth. We have an incredible product designer who makes all of our <laughs> stuff look beautiful. And anything you see that isn't beautiful is probably because I made the first draft. So I'll take all <laughs> credit for it. any bad design you see is my fault. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing to think about how critical the mission is and, and what you all have committed to actually achieving it. And, and then I'm curious just from my own personal experience, Diz, I'll, I'll go to you on this one is I guess from my experience of say, giving things a second life, I think about thrift shops, at least for clothes, thrift mm, shops, yeah. I think about even companies like Ross and TJ Maxx, who are Goodwill, who redistribute products that either are unusable or have too much supply. But there's, and there's a disconnect between reusing or giving that item a second life versus just kind of putting them back into this retail ecosystem. What is really kind of captivated you to, to and, and what, what nonprofit organizations are really pushing the envelope to redistribute these resources, not even just to the traditional means in, in terms of the groups that we commonly think of, but even just for the purpose of these not going into a landfill. What has that relationship been like outside of, say, what I guess my and maybe more common experience is with secondhand items? Yeah. Or unused I mean, items, yeah. Of course, it's a great question. And I, I've always loved thrifting. I don't know what it is, but I've always really enjoyed finding things at a at a deal like something that had some like vintage quality to it i've always been drawn to that and so it definitely took a while for me to understand that that definitely wasn't cool for everyone and yeah. so one of the things that we're trying to do here is like 
we could showcase that like this this is fun this isn't just like necessarily yeah. like sad like sarah mclaughlin feed the children type commercial yeah. like donating can be fun it can be new it can be like sure. new products reusing things is is awesome and it's something yeah. that is really impactful in the climate space so it's one of the easiest things that you can do is to to be more conscious about reusing products so yeah i'm i'm, cu I'm curious to hear your response to, to this at least in, in my experience it seems as though a lot of the, the younger generation the gen z kind of is really popularizing this philosophy not only to connect with brands but also to share redistribute and not waste and when you talk about like oh donating can be cool it, I feel like the perspective I'm seeing is really just like throwing waste up is not cool and, and putting more yeah. waste in this world is not cool. So let's figure out what we have and how to connect with people. Love to hear a response to that. Are, are you seeing that kind of wave of thought becoming more popularized? What are you seeing in particular that's, Absolutely. I guess, supporting and pushing it forward? Yeah. So in 2020, Salesforce did a study where they found that 90% of consumers expect the companies that they buy from to clearly demonstrate their values. And yeah. the values around sustainability and climate change, those are all very popular right now. I mean, we're seeing a huge boom in the space and also even with people in general just shifting their values. I mean, when we talk to people who are interviewing to work at Liquid Donate, they're coming from some of these huge tech companies and saying, yeah. during the pandemic, I just kind of rethought my values and I wanted to work somewhere where I could build technology that made a difference. And yeah. that's awesome. It's awesome to see that happening in the tech space. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Chai and I have been working in social impact in the tech space and to see how popular it is now is just like, it's just, it's awesome. Yeah. And yeah, we've seen a ton of nonprofits that have a lot of Gen Z folks in them that are working to try to make a difference either in terms of supporting refugees that are being brought into the United States or uh, supporting people experiencing homelessness, going through food security, doing harm reduction work. Yeah. I mean, it, it really it really runs the gamut on like who we work with on the nonprofit side and anyone can register as long as they're a yeah. 501c3 nonprofit. We will work to get them what it is that they need, either through them uploading items that they have on a wish list or just shopping from yeah. the items that the retailers are already donating. Yeah. A question for both of you. What's been something really exciting slash surprising that you didn't think was a possibility in terms of a nonprofit wanting or something or a company <laughs> giving away something and connecting? What's been a really interesting and cool connection that you've both seen? Diz, I'll let you go first and then we'll pass the chat. Mm. Okay, I was going to let Chai go first because, <laughs> yeah. gosh, there's been so many. Okay, so I'm going to go with, okay, there's this company called Verloop, V-E-R-L-O-O-P, and they make new products like handbags and socks and slippers and hats and all these different things out of yeah. yarn that was refuse from a traditional piece of clothing that was being made so all of the like little bits of yarn that yeah. usually go in the trash they collect all of those and then they make new products out of them which is awesome totally aligned with our yeah. mission and i've been a big fan of this brand for a while i have their slippers i have one of their beanies <laughs> i'm like really into it and uh they came to us and said that they had products that they wanted to donate and they just had some excess beanies for children like kid sized mm -hmm. small beanies that they wanted to donate and just uh, getting a donation from a company that I really liked and that yeah. I already used their product. And then I also got the opportunity to talk to the nonprofit that received them, that were giving them to, to kids that needed them. It was just like, it's, it was such a small donation in terms of, of the volume that we can do. But I yeah. almost like, I was like, if this is the only thing we ever do is like match like these kids with these like really cool, beautiful sustainable <laughs> hats, like I just, it was really moving. So yeah, uh, definitely not our biggest product move, but one of the, one of the most meaningful for me. Uh, I love that. I love that. Chai, your turn, please. Yeah. Same for me. Like there have been so many eye-opening discoveries that we've come across while building liquid on it that it's really hard to like pinpoint one. The thing that comes to my mind and the revelation that I've had that still sticks is uh, that we can donate anything. Okay. Yeah. And, yeah. and I mean that we can literally donate anything because when we started our company, we were working with a furniture brand and they were giving us uh, furniture that they couldn't sell in their outlets. But sometimes they would also give us furniture that was like damaged. Like yeah, a broken slightly leg damaged. Or like a, 
slightly damaged. Yeah. Right. Like a dented bed frame or like a broken chair with like a broken leg or whatever. And then we were still able to donate those to somebody. And I was like, okay, like this thing which we consider as useless is still of value to someone. So that was pretty surprising for me. And then other example I can think of is this one other person wanted to donate sushi kits on our platform. So we managed to donate 900 cases of sushi kits to a nonprofit. Really? Yeah. So I was, you know, when they approached us, I was like, who's going to take 900 cases of sushi kits? But then and we I managed was like, to find a go. nonprofit. We got this. <laughs> I love what so, so just finishing on that thought, I mean, I, I really feel like uh, though it's the value of some item is not really apparent to us when we see it, I feel like there's always someone who would have some use for it. And that makes yeah. gives me the confidence that we can donate anything that comes in our platform. Yeah, yeah. And thinking about just the company overall, what's been exciting about the track you've seen thus far and what's particularly exciting about the next phase of growth that, that you look forward to? Dave, I'll let you go. Yeah, so as of, as of today, we've donated over 4 million items and that's been over $8 million in retail value. And we've diverted wow. almost half a million pounds of waste from the landfill. And like Chai said, we've only really been in business for a little over a year and a half. So we know that seeing our month over month growth and seeing how many retailers are working with us and making consistent donations, the integrations with loop returns and the other return services that are providing donations on a daily basis, like it's the opportunity is huge and we're seeing that grow. And we're also seeing people be excited about what yeah. we're doing. And it's, it's, it's difficult, but it's fun. And it's really, mm. really exciting and cool. So we, the, the big picture is that we really focus on landfill diversion. That's the number one metric. How much material are we really diverting from landfills and getting it into the hands of people who need it? And we want to be the return solution when people are like, hey, I have this unsellable product, I know that I can uh, send it to Liquid Donate and Liquid Donate will be the marketplace that matches it with the nonprofit that needs it. Whether it's a single item that's being returned, like a t-shirt yeah. that you didn't want, it was a wrong size, or anything up to a box, a pallet, an entire truckload. We've handled up to 40 truckloads of, of chocolate that was being donated. We've we've done it all, and I'm excited to see what we keep doing yeah. in, the, in the future. I love getting the weird ones. It's, it's yeah. super it's super exciting. The sushi kits is crazy. I can't believe you you were able to distribute and get somebody to take all the. Was it like a class? Was it what, what was the nonprofit? <laughs> I think it was a nonprofit that was trying to teach culinary skills to people, yeah. and they were like, our students will work with these, so yeah. they took them. Uh, yeah. Well, it's also, I mean, it's an, introducing a new cuisine. That's such a cool, positive experience because there's there's more than just, hey, I didn't throw this in the garbage. It's like, okay, the, the repurposing of this, the retooling, the teaching, I mean, it, it all kind of cascades in such a positive direction. But I'm, from a business standpoint, try or just feel free either one of you to take this. What are some of the biggest risks that you see your company can be facing today? Well, on the, on the retail side, like, I think one of the things to note is that not only was it a nice to do for that retailer to make the donation of those sushi kits, but they also got a tax receipt. It was cheaper than landfilling it. We handled all yeah. of the logistics of giving it to the nonprofit for them. And then also the other thing a lot of people aren't really aware of unless they have a retail business, especially an e-commerce or a drop shipping business, is how expensive yeah. it is to store product. Uh, yeah. And so donating it can actually be a way to get the product out of the warehouse where you're paying storage costs. So it's like another way to do cost savings. And so we've actually had a number of, of brands and businesses come to us and say, hey, we have three pallets of product in the storage facility. We're not going to be able to sell it in time for it to be cost effective for us. So we actually just want to donate it. We work with a number of brands that, that have had yeah. that problem and perfectly good usable product that otherwise would have been sent to the landfill ends up yeah. in the hands of, of the right people. So that's really cool. Yeah. In yeah. terms of challenges, I mean, it's a, a difficult climate to raise money to, in right now. I think that's something that we're we're walking into and we're not sure. scared of it. We're facing it head on and we're still going at it with our our big audacious goals that we have of what we what we want to raise, what we will raise, what we will do with the cash and how we will continue to grow and scale our team and our company. Yeah. So I think the market 
is is a pretty important thing that people are paying attention to right now. Yeah, yeah. Hey, Chai, do you need anything to add to that? Yeah, so, I mean, in, if, if you have to ask me about what challenges we might face as a business, one of, I mean, pro- probably I'll say that time might be a mm. challenge for us because otherwise the value that we offer to retailers is something very unique and something that they don't have right now that time is probably the only thing that they'll push us on. And when I say time, I mean more like, okay, they give us like a huge pallet of say, I don't know, t-shirts to donate. And they tell us you move this bill within a week or move this within two weeks. And yeah, us having to do a stick to that time is probably critical for us. Because right now the alternative is if we don't move it within those two weeks, they're going to take it and like throw it in the, uh, throw it in the landfill, which yeah. is not a desirable solution or, or a solution for anyone. So yeah. us having to act quickly, find a nonprofit and move that quickly is probably our, going to be our biggest challenge in the upcoming months. Yeah. Yeah. If everything goes well, what's the long-term vision for Liquid Donate? Do you, do you hope to never be in business again? But if, if everybody stops having so much excess in the world, obviously that's, I don't know if you or I will see that in, in any of our lifetimes, but what's the long-term vision for the company? Where, where do you aim to go from here? Maybe I'll give you the vision for like, say the next few years, because I mean, the next few years are going to be pretty critical in deciding how shopper trends and retailer trends yeah. are going to be in terms of like reducing waste. Like today, everyone is like generating waste and we are trying to solve for the problem where we take that waste and put it to give it, donate it to nonprofits or like give it a new purpose or something. But going forward, I think retailers will start thinking about like how they can actively like reduce waste so they don't have to like work with companies like ours, which take away whatever they cannot sell. So yeah, the long-term vision is obviously to like reduce the amount of the things that are coming through our pipeline. I mean, and naturally businesses are like thinking about not sending things into landfill or whatever, but then yeah, the short-term vision is trying to capture a large share of the retail market and offer a solution for them that they don't have right now. Yeah. Yeah. This would love to hear your thoughts too. Yeah, I'm definitely the realist in the in this co-founder <laughs> team where I do not believe that retailers will ever figure out how to do appropriate inventory management, understand shopper trends so well that there won't ever be excess inventory. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I also don't believe that there will ever be a world in which returns don't exist because it, customers expect there to be a returns yeah. process and 95% of customers who have a bad experience with the returns are less likely to buy from that brand again. And so yeah. taking away the returns process completely eliminates some customers from their pipeline. And because we live in a capitalist society, I just don't really foresee that changing. And so for me, yeah. the, the vision for what we'll do is we'll continue to grow, we'll continue to get bigger, we'll continue to handle more returns more seamlessly, more excess inventory more seamlessly. The vendors that we have, yeah. the retailers, the brands, the businesses, they'll be able to tell us sooner when they have products that is going to expire or have a best by yeah. date so that we can actually match and move it even faster so that it has a bit of a longer shelf life with the nonprofits. And so it's really, to me, watching the inventory management systems and projections get better over time so that we do see a reduction, but I don't think we'll ever see a, a complete fall out of that and yeah i think our our goal is to start work internationally next year and then continue to grow our footprint all over the world until that so that by the end of a decade in business we have worldwide coverage so if we can be as big as uber when someone thinks about having something delivered or having a, a ride share hailed they think of Uber. I'm going to Uber that. I'm going to take an Uber, whatever it is. And we want it to be the same as like, "Mm, I I, I want to get rid of this item, but it's still in good condition. I want to liquid donate it. We want to, we want to be a verb in that sense. So yeah. Yeah. The other thing is like, we also see like with Goodwill, 40% of the items that are brought to Goodwill end up in the landfill as well. And so is there a way that we can make this choice that the nonprofits have of choosing what it is that they get and they get it for free? And we handle the logistics, so it's just easier than throwing it away for the retailer. It's easier than not having it for the mm-hmm. for the nonprofit that needs it. If we can just make this situation and that's so simple for both parties that it's like an obvious like match, then that's like where we 
we would be successful. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. I, I know we're coming to the, the close, but I still have some FAQs for you. So I'm going to hit you both with some rapid fire questions and we'll see where we get. So first question, I will, I'll start with Divs and then I'll uh, serve it to Chai. Uh, what's particularly hard about your job day to day? Oh my gosh. <laughs> the amount of apologies I owe to all of the former CEOs. <laughs> I would say that's, that's the biggest difficulty is realizing how much work is actually going on behind the scenes that yeah. you don't see that a CEO is responsible for. And so you always say, why are they missing my meeting? Why aren't they answering my text? And you're like, oh my God, like it's because there's That's actually why. a million things going on. <laughs> I love that. Chai, for you. The biggest challenge is probably figuring out what the user wants because we're building something which the user does not have today. And yeah, we're trying to offer them something that they don't have. And like that is always a challenge in terms of figuring out it what we're building is valuable for them or not. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know if you both are able to, but you know, if you think about two, maybe three sentences on what, what a, whether it's an experience or whether it was uh, enlightenment or an epiphany, what, what essentially um, guided you personally to work in a space that works with sustainability, works with climate, but does so with a lot of technology integrated this. What, what inspired you, if you can give me two to three sentences, maybe an experience, maybe an anecdote, and then I'll yeah. obviously pitch it to chat. No worries. So I grew up in a working class family. My parents worked in retail up until their retirement. I've worked in restaurants and I've seen the waste firsthand, fell into the tech space very luckily and saw how much tech could make an impact on people's lives and uh -huh. wanted to do something more than just helping people get something small, but really solve a, a big problem. And as an activist, sustainability and climate tech is, is the way to do that. Yeah, I love that. Chai, for you. So I've always been passionate about impact. And, um, I just, I don't mean just social impact. It could be any kind of impact which the user experiences through using an app or some other service that's provided with by another software. And I realized that with tech, you can scale out this impact to a large number of users. Yeah. And then working at Postmates and with this building those food security products, I kind of realized social impact is way more meaningful than any other kind of user impact that we can have. Yeah. Obviously, like getting food to people who cannot afford it is way more important than delivering food to teenagers that order it on the Postmates app. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, that's how I got pulled into the whole social impact and sustainability space. And I've realized that tech is probably by far the best way to make a dent in this sustainability space, because that's where we, you can actually move the numbers and needle a lot. Yeah. Yeah. You know, what, what's something that if you weren't working on this, what would you be working on? Chai, I'll let you go first. That's a hard question because I've always been just thinking about like sustainability ever since we built those food security products that it's kind of hard to think what I would be doing if I was not doing this. I mean, there are so, I'm, I think it'll be something still in social impact just because there are like so many areas that tech can be used for social impact. Like we thought about a few of those products at Postmates as well. Like some of them did not come into fruition. Like obviously landfill diversion is one of the things in the space, but I'm sure I would be working on something related to social impact if I was not doing liquid on it. Yeah. Yeah. This is for you. I would be doing this. There's yeah. no alternative. <laughs> I love, I love asking founders that question because it's either one of those answers. Like I have no clue, maybe I'll do something or it's like, I, I've never thought about anything other than this for the last five years. <laughs> but it, but is, it goes to show. This is it. This is my, yeah. this is my dream. This is my passion. And yeah. It's, we really figured out a really interesting and cool niche that is really profitable. Yeah. We solve a real solution or we solve a real problem and we're able to get paid by the folks who have the capital to pay for this. Yeah. And it's a solution that's better for everybody. And I think we're very, very lucky that we were able to hit the nail on the head so quickly. Yeah. Yeah. And, and uh, honestly, I mean, I, I've run a recruiting agency for a few years. It's like, you're not even, uh, pricing is an issue for a lot of companies, especially in the commodities business, but for your company in particular, it's amazing how technology has able to really kibosh that main blocker for a lot of your clients, yep. which is just the cost of it. And it's so impressive to see that because then you're, you're everything else is playing catch up. And right now, I'm sure it, it sounds like it's just growth and scale and, and adding more 
to what you're able to do and capable of doing. So exciting to, to hear and see and, and kind of share that message. But last question for both of you, what's a, what's a book or an individual, something that is impactful for you today, whether it's piece of advice, a message, anything in particular that you would like to share with other founders out there? Div, I'll let you go first. So this is what I always say when I'm asked this question, and it's not exactly pertinent to what you said, but one of the things I'm on the board of a nonprofit and then I volunteer with a nonprofit every week and just having been in the nonprofit space and having that be our clientele here, one of the things that I really like to let people know is that it's really important that if you are someone who's doing philanthropy and you are doing philanthropy in order to really do good and give back, It's really important that if you're giving cash grants that you provide unrestricted grants. I think Mm -hmm. this is one of the things that a lot of people don't think about, but having been in the nonprofit space and now in this VC funded startup, if a venture capital firm is willing to give us two and a half million dollars or so in order to take it and run with it and run the company the way that we see fit because they believe in us, they believe in our vision, they believe in the product. Nonprofits should have that same level of of trust. They're the same people yeah. doing really important life-saving work as well. And uh, by giving a restricted grant, they're constantly having to report on it to specifically apply it to programmatic work versus maybe even employee salaries when they could be yeah. needing to attract some different types of talent. So unrestricted grants for nonprofits is my is my soapbox of the of the decade. I love it. I love it. Chai, any books, advice, or, or soapbox materials that you'd like to share? <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't have any books that come to mind, but basically what I've realized in the last few years is that any product that people design these days can have positive social impact built into it. And I think going forward, most product designers and builders should be thinking about how whatever they build will benefit people without any capitalistic gains. And the simplest example is before Liquid on it, I was trying to work at another startup, which was trying to revolutionize online checkout for retailers. And one of the main reasons I joined that company was because I wanted to build a ground up and donate feature for that company. And then another example I can think of is, I think Airbnb was sometime trying to offer accommodation for refugees somewhere. Like, I don't remember which country. So basically what I'm trying to say is uh, any product can have a social impact kind of like built into it. And I feel like more builders and entrepreneurs should be thinking about that whenever they build something new. Yeah. Yeah. Beautifully said, both of you. And it's been such a pleasure having you both share not only what you've been working on at Liquid Donate, but what inspires you, what are the possibilities that they could actually lead to. And overall, the the numbers I think are astounding um, to really kind of uh, honestly sit with and, and understand how much is within the system is broken in particular, not utilizing what we're creating and overall just, just getting rid of it versus uh, redistributing it and using technology behind it. So it's been such a pleasure having you both on the show. Last little bit fun. is where can we find and support you as founders? Give us your LinkedIn's, your Twitter's. Where can we be a fan of both of you? Try you go first. Sure. So I'm, I'm active on LinkedIn. My LinkedIn username is Chai Nadig without any space. And uh, I'm on Twitter as well, but then I'm not that as active on Twitter as I'm on LinkedIn. So Twitter handle is like Chai underscore Nadig. And if not any of these social handles, you can always reach me at my company email at Chai at liquidonate.com. Amazing. Yeah. Dan, this please. Cool. So at liquidonate, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, I'm very active. You can find me, Diz Petit, P-E-T-I-T. And yeah, also very open to Diz at liquidonate.com. If you want to reach out, happy to... Have a quick call, brainstorm. If you're a nonprofit, you have questions about registering. If you're a retailer and you want to donate, have any additional questions, please reach out. We'll connect you with the right person on our team. And last second shout out to everyone on our team who makes all of this possible and just wanted to make sure they get a shout out because I, I love and adore them. And they're they're the ones really making this this impact and making this product so that we can really change the world. Amazing. It's been such a pleasure having you both on the show. I hope you've enjoyed it. And thank you again for being on Behind Company Lines today. Thanks so much. It's been fun. See you later.